Hello everybody. So this video cast will look at the changing nature of the Social Democratic Party 1949 uh, to 1960. Um, it's uh, approaching the end of the second depth study. This is following on from the previous lessons um, at Adenauer and the, and the uh, CDU. Um, uh, one topic left after this, which will be denazification. So uh, the picture you're looking at there, uh, the caption um, tells you um, everything you need to know, really. Um, taken in 1961, you can see pictured from left, um, you've got John F. Kennedy, the American president. Um, on the far right, you've got um, Adenauer. And in the middle, you've got um, the SPD mayor of West Berlin at that time, uh, Willy Brandt, um, who actually um, became chancellor of Germany, the first SPD chancellor of Germany in 1969. Let's move on. There's the reading. Um, highlighted is the topic that we're doing today. Um, so as you can see, William Carr... Um, Turner, some good extracts from chapter four of Turner, um, and Williamson, the um, access to, uh, so the seminar studies and history uh, series written for A level. Um, there's a good section on pages 55 to 59. You've got photocopies of the Turner and the Williamson, so hopefully you've got those beside you. Um, as we go through the notes, um, I will um, point you to the relevant pages. I would advise that you pause. Um, read those sections at that point um, and throughout the whole process be mapping the key points from the notes um, which uh, the, the, the notes information is on the slideshow be mapping the key things over onto your mind map as we go through tomorrow's lesson um, denazification if you can make sure that you've read the textbook pages 146 251 uh, prior to that lesson and just a reminder I won't take you through that but your next section BSA is due in at the latest by Thursday the 15th of March okay so this is uh, the uh, pa the page of depth 34 possible questions from the checklist um, that I gave you um, early on in the course and I've highlighted for you uh, the types of questions um, bearing in mind this is um, we have limited information at such an early stage in the specification the specification has only been set for one year at this point in time 2017 so most of these questions are taken from the revision guide um, including the two that I've highlighted. So you've got one, how accurate would it be to say that the SPD was largely irrelevant in West Germany in the years 1949 to 1960? <clears throat> That's obviously um, in the context of yesterday's lesson as well. So it's, it's presenting to you to the proposal um, that the history of West Germany was very much shaped by Adenauer and the CDU, but it's asking you to debate that, which obviously means you need to um, look at the arguments for and against. And then the second one, to what extent did the SPD play a significant role in West Germany in the years 1949 to 60? Very similar type of question there. Therefore, um, it, it, implicitly, it's asking you to weigh up the contribution of the SPD as opposed to the CDU that was the governing party throughout this period. Um, clearly on the surface, the, um, the, the, the main development of West Germany was led by Adenauer and the CDU. Um, it's asking for you to debate that and to see whether the, C, the, the SPD, although an opposition party in this time, um, was still able to play a role in West Germany's history. And there is the mind map. Um, use this to map key points around the edge as I go through the slideshow. <clears throat> um, starting with the introduction, Schumacher versus Adenauer, um, the 1949 elections. Adenauer's first term, 1949 to 53. Um, and then the rebrand of the SPD following the death of Schumacher, who was the leader until 1952. Um, so the rebrand in the late 1950s, and in particular the Godesberg programme and the contribution of Willy Brandt. 
So we'll start off with the introduction, a little bit of background about the SPD in 1945 and Schumacher. So, as I said, this might be the point you want to pause, Williamson, page 21 to 22. Um, note the issues about divisions within the political left. So Williamson um, includes some useful information on this. Obviously, you know from um, having studied the course since 1871, one of the key factors that shaped German history uh, was that the political left had been divided um, really ever since the 1870s um, between the sort of mainstream political left that developed into the um, SPD, um, who were reformist, who were on the whole moderate, um, although they were Marxists, they believed that the um, pathway needed to be through Parliament, uh, not through revolution. And then, of course, the radical political left, and in particular, they emerged um, and broke away at the end of World War I, um, forming the KPD, the Communist Party. And of course, one of the key arguments is that um, the Weimar Republic um, would have been stronger and more stable if there had been only one political party on the left for the working classes. The fact that there were two and that the SPD um, and the KPD spent more time arguing with each other and disagreeing with each other rather than presenting a united front um, against the rise of the Nazis on the extreme right um, is arguably one of the key reasons that Hitler was able to take power in 1933. Now, of course, as we move into uh, post-World War II um, and the, the uh, Potsdam Agreement um, about maintaining a united Germany, um, uh, that was ag agreed after the end of World War II, um, that issue about making sure that the that the, the Nazism or a similar right wing movement should never be allowed to raise its heads again in post war Germany um, was very much in the fore in the fore minds of um, the political leaders on the left, um, and so there was initially of a, a determination um, that we need to pull the political left together into one party. That, however, did not happen. Those old divisions between the SPD and the KPD um, reappeared again after World War II. And of course, that was very much exacerbated by the fact that Germany became divided. Um, the SPD, led by Schumacher, um, put forward the claim to represent all the workers of Germany. But of course, what happened in the Soviet zone, the Soviet Union forced an amalgamation of the SPD and the KPD to form the Socialist Unity Party, the SED. Um, and that meant the SPD in the other zones of Germany, the British, the, the French and the American zones, um, was forced to go its own way. Um, and lost a lot of its potential support um, because of what happened in the East. So the SPD um, in the Western zone, so that eventually unified into West Germany, largely drew its support from the major industrial areas of West Germany, which were primarily in the British occupation zone in the North and the West of West Germany. So a bit of background, go through the key points there. The SPD leaders had been arrested by the Nazis 1933 uh, to 35, um, uh, gone into exile um, in Paris um, and in Prague, uh, both of which fell under occupation, of the, were invaded by the Germans in the course of the war. Um, so the SPD was reconstituted in June 1945. And then, of course, in the Soviet zone, you've got that forced amalgamation to form the SED. Uh, so that was very much recognised by the Soviet Union. There needed to be one political party to represent um, the workers to prevent fascism rearing its head again. But, of course, the SPD in the Western controlled zones went its own way, led by a very, very charismatic and dominant um, politician called Kurt Schumacher, 
um, who had been imprisoned by the Nazis in concentration camps. Very um, poor health, but a very, very popular and charismatic leader uh, until he died in 1952. So, 10 years in Dachau. Uh, there's a picture of him there on the front cover of Time magazine. Um, that edition appeared shortly after his death in 1952. Um, so by the end of World War II, he was the only surviving SPD leader who had neither fled Germany nor collaborated with the Nazis. And that gave him enormous popularity and prestige amongst the German working classes. He was very much seen as a, as a um, socialist hero um, who had um, survived Nazi imprisonment um, without having fled abroad. Determined to push the SPD in a socialist um, direction, but likewise very much anti-communist. Um, he believed in reform through parliament rather than through revolution. And so he strongly resisted any calls for the SPD to cooperate with the KPD in the western zones of Germany. Now, of course, in the eastern zones of Germany, the SPD and the KPD were forcibly united. Um, but Schumacher, with his strong views, was not prepared. He saw the SPD as the, the, the only party that should represent the workers of Germany. And so he refused any calls to cooperate. He was also a strong nationalist. Um, he was a pa patriotic German. He believed fiercely um, in um, a that Germany should continue to be a united, not a divided country. Um, so when Germany did divide in 1949, he saw Adenauer's support for the division for the reasons we looked at in yesterday's lesson. But he believed Adenauer was basically betraying Germany. Um, uh, Schumacher believed that German reunification um, was central um, to the um, building of socialism for the future. Um, so in order for socialism to take root in the future, reunification had to happen first. Therefore, it was necessary, in his view, to appeal to middle-class voters as well as working-class voters in order to win power because um, nationalism um, was uh, largely supported by the German middle classes. Okay, let's move on to the next strand. Uh, so the Schumacher versus Adenauer um, disagreement, which really dominated politics, um, in the first four years of the history of the New West Germany. So again, there are some page references there for you um, to Williamson, pages 55 to 58. Um, note the common ground explained on pages 55 and 57. Uh, so it's very easy to leap into a um, explanation of the fact that Schumacher and Adenauer were fierce rivals, um, which the textbook very much focuses on. But it is also important to sh um, show knowledge and understanding that they actually did admire each other and that they did share a lot of common ground. And that was important. When we come on to the, towards the end of this slideshow, we look at the significance of um, the development of the SPD and why the West German Republic was able to survive when the Weimar Republic had not. Um, one of the key points is that there was no room for compromise in the Weimar years between the SPD and the more right-wing parties. Whereas what was different with with West Germany, although there was rivalry between the two leading parties, there was also a common ground between them. Um, so Williamson on page 55 and 57 is very good on that. See also Turner, pages 118 to 120 and 128 to 9. Um, so I'll leave you to decide when you want to pause um, this video and just have a quick read through that and supplement your notes from those pages. But let's just go through the key points. So intense rivals, 
for several reasons. Okay, so learn these reasons. There are a number of them listed here. So first of all, um, uh, Adenauer um, basically accused the SPD of being unpatriotic to the new West Germany. Um, in Adenauer's view, the SPD um, were left wing. And so he saw them as being a Marxist party. He saw them as being an internationalist party. Um, and of course, uh, because the Soviet zone of Germany, um, and in the context of the growth of the Cold War, but the Soviet zone was obviously um, Marxist uh, in the way in which it was run. Um, Adenauer saw um, Schumacher and the SPD of basically be betraying um, German ideals. Schumacher, on the other hand, countered that argument by saying that the CDU um, was merely a puppet to the Catholic Church that was internationalist. Um, and of course, one of the points is, is that Adenauer was a Catholic. Schumacher was a Protestant. Um, so beneath their rivalry, there was religious rivalry. The, those deep-rooted feelings that Protestantism, um, if you were a Protestant, you were, um, you were patriotic. It was a church of Germany, whereas Catholic was international. Uh, so that was Schumacher's counter-argument. Um, also, regional. Adenauer was from the Rhineland, which was to the west of West Germany. Schumacher was Prussian. And again, we began our course when we started several months ago, uh, looking at those sort of regional differences. And of course, Catholicism was more based in the west and south of Germany, whereas Protestantism was more based in the north and the east, and in particular, the Prussian areas. Next point, Adenauer was prepared in the short term to place integration with the west first. We did that yesterday in yesterday's um, lesson. Um, we looked at how um, Adenauer basically accepted the fact, although he argued that he wanted German reunification, he saw that as something that could only happen in the long term. And that for German reunification to happen, West Germany needed to develop into a strong, economically prosperous country, which meant Germany therefore would have to be split into a prosperous West and a weak East. And in Adenauer's view, remember we talked about the magnet theory, um, that a strong, prosperous West Germany would be a magnet that would eventually pull East Germany back into the fold and create a united Germany eventually. Um, from Schumacher's point of view, um, he was looking very much in the short term, um, and he saw Adenauer then, because he accepted a divided uh, Germany as necessary, and because Adenauer said that the West Germany needed to fully integrate with Britain, France and America in the West, that Adenauer was basically turning his back on the 17 million Germans living in the German Democratic Republic, and that he was betraying um, that those 17 million Germans. Uh, so Schumacher fiercely disagreed with Adenauer over that, and Schumacher always said reunification must be the top short-term priority and that only after we have got a reunified Germany should we have, re, uh, should we have integration with the West. Um, that the, the integration with the West was effectively a betrayal of Germany. Um, and that was th th certainly the, 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 the sort of central disagreement between Schumacher and Adenauer. Moving on. So, 1949 elections, remember we've covered the key points about this. It was largely fought over economic issues. It was the first Bundestag elections of the new West Germany that was created in 1949. And it was, a, remember, a, very, a narrow victory for the CDU, who got 31%, and the SPD got 29%. So it's look at those elections again from the context, from the viewpoint of the SP. So again, you've got page references there to Williamson and Turner. So you may want to pause the video and 
read those pages and pick out relevant points before you continue with this video. I'll just go straight into the points here. So Schumacher, very, very confident that the SPD would win that election. Remember, we as historians have got hindsight. We look back and we know that the SPD were electorally unsuccessful for the first 20 years of the new West Germany. They didn't take power until 1969 with Billy Brandt. Um, the CDU won the elections, albeit by a narrow margin in 1949, but as we saw yesterday, increasingly um, stronger margins, um, culminating in the overall majority of 1957. Uh, which we covered yesterday. But nevertheless, you've got to be, as historians, it's important we understand history from the perspective of the people living at the time. And Schumacher was confident um, that the SPD would win. Remember, Germany was a war-torn country. It was still very much picking itself out of the rubble of the damage of World War II. Um, a great deal of poverty. Um, the um, economic recovery had certainly not really kicked in by 1949. Yes, the Western zones had merged into Bisonia and then Trisonia. And then, of course, West Germany had been created. Um, there was the grassroots of economic recovery, but the vast majority of Germans were impoverished and in that context um, would normally have given their support to the left-wing political parties, in this case, the SPD. So... The election campaign, as we said, was largely fought over the future direction of Germany's economy. The SPD stuck to their Marxist philosophy um, that uh, the that economic development should take the direction of a planned economy with a great deal of state intervention, strong central control of that. The the CDU and Adenauer, of course, countered that with their social market economy philosophy, which we will develop in more detail in a subsequent lesson when we look at economic change during this period. Remember, the key person there was Ludwig Erhard of the CDU. And that was very much the argument that, yes, there will be intervention by the state. This will not be a laissez-faire economy in which market forces, businessmen, etc. have complete control over economic direction. There will be um, central direction by the state, but not in terms of a planned economy, which is what the SPD wanted, more in terms of being a market policemen. So market forces, free market forces, supply and demand, etc., will continue to um, in, uh, play an important part. Um, profit, free enterprise, etc., has got to be central. It's got to motivate. Uh, initiative has got to be allowed. So therefore, we're saying it is retaining the right wing capitalist philosophy, but it will not be unbridled capitalism, such as the, what happened in the 1920s, um, which Hitler was able to take advantage of. Why did the CDU win that election? Well, remember, they only just won the election, 31% as opposed to 29%. It was a very, very narrow margin. Um, they had an immediate advantage um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the social market economy idea had already started to reap positive results. Because remember, in 1947, um, so 47 to 48, um, the, 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 the US and British zones had merged into Bisonia. Um, this was before West Germany came into existence, and, by, and that was an economic union, an agreement to work together economically. And then, of course, the French had come on board, and the three zones had merged in 1948 to become Trizonia. And the social market economy principles had been applied 
within Bisonia and Trisonia. So by 1949, by the time of the first West German election, um, the grassroots of that pol policy was starting to emerge. People were, being aw were becoming aware that the CDU had found a different way forward um, beyond the traditional um, one way or the other, should it be a planned left-wing economy or free a free unbridled capitalist economy. Well, there, there seemed to be a third way here that seemed to be working. So that was certainly a factor. Other factors. Schumacher, throughout the campaign, strongly attacked the Catholic Church, which um, um, had given its support to the CDU, taking that sort of line of the Catholic Church as being an international movement. Um, and of course, strong views across Germany about division and the fact that Germany, of course, was occupied by the four occupying powers of America, Russia, Britain and France. Um, Schumacher's line was that the Catholic Church was the fifth occupying power. Um, but attacking 45% of West Germans, because that is what they were, now that East Germany had become separated from the West, um, the proportion of Catholics had in, in the Western zones effectively was greater and had increased, I think, from 37% to 45%. So nearly half of the Germans in West Germany were Catholic. So in the middle of an election campaign, attacking Catholic voters um, didn't really go down very well. So that was a miscalculation by um, Schumacher. Um, also crucial, of course, was the fact that 1949 was the year when the Cold War really began properly um, with the Berlin blockade. Um, crisis, the airlift. Um, and so with that, there was a strong fear in the West of the USSR. I mean, after all, what did the USSR do? They blockaded um, Berlin. Um, and there was that sort of fear of, of, of Stalin and the USSR and what might they do next, heightened by, a year later, the outbreak of the Korean War, when North Korea attacked South Korea. So very much in the West, there was the perception um, at this time, a, a turning point, that the Russians were taking a much more aggressive footing. Um, so that aggressive line by the Soviet Union, um, that fe the, the fear that resulted in the West amongst West German voters, um, meant that when voters are fearful, they will look for, for, for additional support. So they were increasingly attracted to the conservative right in that election, the CDU. Why? Because, of course, the CDU was backed by America, who viewed the CDU as a much more reliable force if communism was going to be contained behind the Iron Curtain. Um, how are you going to contain communism behind the Iron Curtain if you support the SPD? Because the SPD will basically want to have a united Germany, a united neutral Germany. Well, that was seen to be a very, very risky strategy. Um, uh, better to have a divided Germany in which the communists have no influence at all in the West than to have a united Germany in which... Um, the Soviet Union and communism have some influence across the whole of Germany. So thus America's decision to back the CDU. Personality uh, of the leaders, um, Adenauer versus Schumacher, also played a leading role. Uh, as we know, Schumacher was in Ill, Ill health. He was very damaged after 10 years in Dachau concentration camp. Um, for that reason, Schumacher was not able to attend the Parliamentary Council, which you will remember was the organisation that drafted the West German Constitution. Um, he had medical complications arising from an operation at that time. That meant, as a result, the Parliamentary Council was chaired by Comrade Adenauer. And whilst that whole process of drafting the constitution was happening of course 
that was getting a lot of attention in the media and Adenauer, his name was on the headlines of all German papers for months and months and months. So by the time the first Bundestag elections came, later in 1949, Adenauer was a household name. He was well known as the man who had effectively led the drafting of the new constitution of Germany. So that, very again, very much played into the hands of the CDU in the first election. So given all those factors, it's actually quite surprising that the SPD only narrowly lost the election rather than significantly. They did well in the first election, but those factors um, worked in the favour of Adenauer. So as you say, they got 29% of the Bundestag seats that the SPD, the CDU, won 31% of those seats. OK, so let's look at the period 1949 to 53 now. Again, page references there for you to pick up. Williamson, 55 to 58. Um, Carr, page 381. Turner, page 128 to 9. If you want to pause and have a quick look at those pages, pull out some key points and then come back to the video. pick up the key points. So key feature of this first four to five years of the West Germany of West German history uh, was the conflict between Schumacher and Adenauer. Okay, Schumacher vehemently strongly opposed many of Adenauer's key policies, for example. So we're picking up um, points that were from yesterday's lesson about Adenauer. So um, Adenauer, of course, wanted West Germany to fully integrate integrate with Western Europe and NATO, and of course that happened. We've talked about the um, ECSC, uh, the European Coal, uh, Coal and Steel Council. We've talked about um, incorporation into NATO. Um, Schumacher opposed Adenauer's plans because Schumacher felt that the more West Germany integrated herself with France, Britain and America, the more difficult it would make for West Germany to reunite with East Germany in the future. Um, that if Ger West Germany and East Germany were going to reunite, West Germany needed to be looking eastwards, not looking westwards. Okay, so um, that was a fundamental point. Um, so again, I've made a particular reference there for you to page 56 of Williamson. Um, uh, so have a quick look at that now. This is an example of uh, where the, the advantages of, of uh, reading widely, um, picking up points that are not in the textbook. This isn't pointed out in the textbook at all. Um, but Martin Niemöller, um, <coughs> like Schumacher, was um, um, a key opponent of, German, of, of Nazi Germany and, like Schumacher, had been imprisoned uh, throughout much of the Third Reich. Uh, and Niemöller emerged as a sort of leading church leader. The, uh, he was a leader of the evangelical church um, in Germany after the war. And Niemöller, um, a very, very popular um, church leader. And so Schumacher effectively, uh, during the election campaign uh, formed an, a, a tactical alliance uh, with Niemöller. That really, really worried Adenauer um, because uh, of Niemöller's popularity. Um, so Adenauer was very fearful that that uh, would work against him. So pick up those details from Williamson. Uh, next point, Schumacher also rejected Adenauer's policy of economic integration with the West. Um, because it would strengthen a free market capitalist economy across its member states. Uh, so again, we'll develop that sort of notion <clears throat> more when we look at the when we go to the breadth study economic development uh, next lesson. Um, but clearly, Adenauer's policies of the free market of the so the social market economy are more on the right wing uh, of economic theory and. He very much wanted to integrate that economy with the French and the British and the Americans. Um, Schumacher argued instead that 
reunification must be the first aim. That must happen first. And only after we have a reunified Germany, only then should a unified Germany attempt to integrate with the West. But as we said earlier, integration first will slow down the process of achieving reunification. Um, if only West Germany integrates with the Western European countries, then it will bind West Germany more closely with the West, which will accentuate the division between West Germany and East Germany. Schumacher also denounced Adenauer uh, for being a puppet of America. Um, we opened this slide, of course, with a photograph of Adenauer meeting Kennedy. Um, he argued that Adam, Adenauer was only too eager to work with the Allied occupying powers, in other words, the British, the French and the Americans. Uh, Schumacher argued that the needs of German reunification must come before cooperating with the French. So again, um, and, and Britain and, the, and America. So again, Williamson, page 56, 55 to 56, is very good on that. So as a result of all of this, Schumacher was fiercely opposed, of course, to any plans to create a West German army. Um, why? Because he believed that a military alliance with the West would hamper the goal of reunification for similar reasons. And add to that, of course, um, building an army will cost money and that will divert money away from welfare provision, from looking after the needs of ordinary Germans. And of course, um, the SPD being a socialist party, they put at the front of their agenda um, sp spending money on welfare provision um, before rearmament. So all of those factors came into play. There's an interesting poster there. That's uh, on the right. Um, that's an SPD election poster from 1945 uh, calling for a free Frias Socialist, Socialist and Geintz uh, United Germany. Um, so as you can see, strong emphasis with the, with the SPD, there will be one flag for Germany and that we will bring Germany together. We should be eastward looking, not westward looking. Williamson, page 58 to 9. You may want to read that before um, we move on. Uh, but I'll just go straight into it. So August 1952, Schumacher had been in ill health throughout this period anyway. He died of a stroke. The new leader, Eric Ollenhauer, there's a picture of him there. Um, that's a campaign poster uh, from the 1953 Bundestag elections. Um, Ollenhauer lacked the charisma, he lacked the experience of Schumacher. He didn't have that sort of track record from World War II of standing up against the Nazis, etc., etc. Um, so with a less charismatic leader, that did not put the SPD in a good place for the 1953 elections. In addition, by 1953, it was evident that Schumacher's policies were increasingly out of step anyway with the mood of the West German public. Um, the social market economy... Um, proposal pro policies of the CDU who've been governing Germany since 1949 was now definitely producing economic growth um, the uh, uh, we're not just talking about green shoots we're talking about clear evidence of economic growth by 1953 add to that um, this is the context now of the Korean War which started in 1950 um, that when North Korea attacked South Korea and that sort of fear that East Germany might do the same, might attack West Germany. So um, Adenauer's pro-Western foreign policy, um, working with the Americans and the British and building bridges and, um, of course, the agreement that we talked about yesterday where it was agreed that West Germany could now have their own um, uh, West German army, the Bundeswehr, um, all of that made the CDU much more attractive to the voters. So, 1953 election, the vote of the CDU increased from 31% to 45%. The SPD, 
the SPD did not lose votes. It just went, their proportion was static. Uh, so although the CDU still needed to form an alliance with the FDP, the Free Democratic Party, uh, to get their overall majority, nevertheless, clearly, um, the voters of West Germany have given a resounding um, vote uh, of support to Adenauer and the CDU. So, there needs to be a rebrand, there needed to be a new approach. Under Ollenhauer, from 1953 onwards, the SPD certainly, perhaps if not falling into decline, it was certainly um, stagnant, it was not going anywhere. Um, and that's where this key person, uh, Willy Brandt, uh, becomes important. And there he is. Historically, many historians compare Willy Brandt with John F. Kennedy, the American president. A couple of reasons for that. One, that they were contemporaries. Um, uh, Brandt uh, emerged very dominant as the leader of the SPD in the late 1950s, although he did not become Chancellor of Germany until after Kennedy's death. Um, but nevertheless, he was very much in the public eye uh, between 1960 and 1963. And of course, that was the time when Kennedy was president of America. And as you saw um, on the opening slide, there was a famous photograph um, from June 1961 where Kennedy visited Berlin. Um, Adenauer was there as well, but Kennedy's focus was very much on Willy Brandt, the, 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 the German leader of the future. Um, Kennedy, although although Adenauer at that time was Chancellor of Germany, it's almost as if Kennedy w could see that the future lay more with Willy Brandt and the SPD, even though they were in opposition and not in power. So, um, Brandt had been around some time. Um, he became a well-known um, local politician because during the Berlin blockade and airlift crisis, he was the mayor of West Berlin. So that's sort of like key juncture where the attention of the world was focused on the Americans providing an airlift to West Berlin, uh, Brandt standing firm, backed by the Americans, um, it hit the headlines. Uh, and he was very young, like Kennedy, he, um, who also was a very young um, leader. Um, so as we move forward 10 years to the late 50s, early 60s, they were very much very similar. They were young, charismatic, a new brand of politician, very different from the old school of politicians. And Adenauer was increasingly seen as an old school. Remember, Adenauer was old. I mean, he had been mayor of Cologne back at the time of the German Revolution. Uh, so uh, Brandt, young, charismatic, good-looking, he was sort of seemed to be very much um, pushing the SPD into a more modern direction. Um, uh, so, but that being young, good looking and having a track record from being mayor of West Berlin was, of course, not in itself enough um, to um, steer the SPD into power. Um, he needed to back that up with practical policies. And he did. Um, he took the SPD into a new direction. He accepted the realities of the situation in West Germany. He basically said, we, the, the SPD, we are out of touch. Our Marxist policy, our Marxist proposal for a strong centralised state-managed um, economy does not work in the new age post-World War II. And that's why the Godesberg programme of 1959 is so important. So again, I would say go to um, Williamson, page 64 to 5, um, Carr, page 381, and Turner, there's a very good section, um, a four-page section in Turner about the significance of uh, the Bert Gosberg conference and the new policy that was drafted and agreed upon by the SPD um, under 
Brandt's leadership in 1959, the so-called Goldsberg Programme, which basically took the SPD away from its Marxist roots. And they endorsed the concept of the social market economy. Brandt was prepared to acknowledge, rather than just take an ideological, principled um, position of opposition to Adenauer and the CDU, he acknowledged the fact that the CDU, with their social market economy, had got it right. So he said to the S he, the SPD, basically said, yes, we endorse that approach. And if we take power, um, we will not ditch all the good work that um, Adenauer has done, that we will basically adopt uh, many of the same principles. So the SPD now also supported integration with Western Europe. They supported membership of NATO. They softened their anti-Catholic stance. So uh, the Goldsberg programme very much was sort of like bringing the SPD more from the political left to a much more central position as a way of appealing to German voters. And then dramatically, the SPD said, we are very willing to work with the CDU and we will join you in a coalition if you ask us to do that. Up until that point, the general assumption was that the SPD were an opposition party. And so when the CDU did not achieve an overall majority, it wasn't really in anyone's mind that the CDU would coalesce, would join with the SPD. The, the CDU, of course, joined with the smaller FDP. Um, but now Brandt asserted if we... It, it, if, if, this, if in future elections the CDU do not achieve a majority, but you are still the largest party, then we are willing to work with you in a coalition if you ask us to. So the Goesberg programme. So with hindsight, the Goesberg programme marked a major change in direction for the SPD. And we can now see that of course we've got the hindsight, we, we know that it took it took ten more years before that actually reaped results when in nineteen sixty nine the SPD won that election in nineteen sixty nine. But we can now look back and see ten years earlier the Goesberg programme as marking a new beginning of the SPD as a political force. We can see it in other ways, Willy Brandt working very, very closely with John F. Kennedy. There's a picture of them there in 1961. As I say, Adenauer was leader of Germany at that time, but President Kennedy's state visit to Germany, he spent more time with Brandt as the leader of the opposition. Um, and Brandt really courted on that fact and played upon the fact that they were very similar in their outlook, sort of young, um, dynamic, forward-looking um, leaders. And then, in 1966, Brandt's offer of joining the CDU to form a coalition government um, bore fruit. And for the first time, they worked together in a coalition government. Yes, it was led by the CDU. The CDU were the uh, leaders of the government, uh, but uh, the SPD actually were part of a coalition government. They joined in that coalition. Now, again, that's really crucial. Think back to the Weimar Republic. Um, and for much of the history of the Weimar Republic, the SPD were an opposition party, but they refused to join in coalition governments. Why did, why did they do that? Why did they refuse to join in coalition governments in the 1920s? Um, because... They were worried that by associating too closely with the opposite with the party that was in power, that they would alienate their own voters and they would lose votes. Now there was obviously that risk forty years later. Now in the nineteen sixties, um, if the SPD enters a coalition with the CDU, might the SPD lose support in the next election? Might many of their voters be disenchanted with their with with, with their leaders' policies? Um, Brandt was prepared to take that risk 
Uh, and in fact, the German voters saw that as a positive. They saw um, a willingness to compromise and to work um, in coalition as a, as a positive sign. Um, so it was a risky policy, but it worked. And again, you've got to pick out the differences when you write about this in the exam, pick out the differences between the the the, the, the new West German uh, Republic, uh, um, comparing it with the um, Weimar Republic of the 1920s. Why did the Weimar Republic fail, whereas the West German Republic succeeded? So therefore, 1969, Willy Brandt became the first SPD Chancellor of the uh, Federal Republic of Germany. And a huge turning point, because not since 1928, when Muller became Chancellor of Germany, just the year before the Wall Street crash, not since 1928, 41 years has passed since Germany has had an SPD Chancellor. Massive turning point in German history. Conclusions. Okay, so significance, a few pointers here. The rivalry between the CDU and the SPD helped to confirm the fact that unlike the democratic system of the Weimar Republic of the 1920s, which was held up to be a model of democracy and it failed, actually here we've got a democratic system that can actually work. Uh, that for the first time there can be a healthy political debate between the leaders of the government and the leaders of the opposition. Uh, yes, it was fierce rivalry. We talked about Adenauer versus Schumacher, but they respected each other um, and they, had, they found common ground um, and it worked. So although they were rivals, they didn't resort to mudslinging, um, to the type of politics of the Weimar Republic, which basically for, forced governments to only last for a year at most, and then there had to be a new election. Um, but it's a combination, isn't it? It's The personalities were important, the willingness to compromise, to come together, to, to, to work together, even though they disagreed with each other, is obviously one factor. But remember, the other factor is the basic law, the constitution of West Germany, um, helped ensure that there was no division. So you bring the basic law into your answer. If you get a question on this in the exam, um, then obviously you've got to talk about the basic law. And the basic law helped um, this uh, the, the, the helped move this along. That's important as well. Um, so although the SPD and the CDU had differing visions, they were united by a mutual respect. Um, they were different, but they they both valued democracy. And they both jointly rejected extremism. Um, and we'll look at the, this in the next lesson about the denazification um, policies. Um, there was a, a, a sort of neo-Nazi party at the time, the Socialist Reich Party, that was outlawed in, 19, in 1952. Well, that was by the SPD and the CDU working together. Um, so that was important. In contrast, in the Weimar era, in the 1920s, the SPD was so much in opposition to the um, parties that, that were leading Germany that they, and they were also opposed to the communists to such an extent uh, that it's almost that they didn't notice the rise of the Nazis and they allowed Nazism to rise. Whereas here, what's different is that they were clearly got their eye on the ball and knew that they had to work together to prevent the, the, um, the rise of extremism. And of course, the basic law helped as well because of the 5% rule. Uh, they were also united by a firm belief that German nationalism could not be utilised by the extreme right wing. Okay, so again, we'll pick that up in the next lesson. As a result, the CDU and the, C uh, the SPD forged a new and democratic and stable West Germany that was able to move the country away from its authoritarian past big step forward. The problem with the Weimar Republic, on the surface it was democratic, but beneath the surface it was unstable, and beneath the surface it hadn't moved away from its authoritarian past, as we've seen. Um, Eberg-Gruner Pact, the, um, the, the Prussian um, 
elites continue to dominate the Weimar Republic, whereas as we move into the 1950s and 60s, there's a big step away from that, which is what made it so significant. That's basically it. Just a reminder then uh, of the next lesson, uh, which will be tomorrow, which will be about denazification. We'll do that in one lesson. Um, uh, and the reading is from the textbook, page 146 to 151. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope that was useful to you. Goodbye.